up on the screen. Now, uh, it probably looks like the bumper end of a car to you, and you're right if you guess that. How many other things have you seen with the word hybrid on it? Huh? Okay, plants that you grow in the garden, maybe. What else? Yeah. You can get uh, hybrid seeds. You can get non-hybrid seeds. Uh, but I would say they're getting harder to get to. What else? What else? Fish. You get hybrid fish. Really? Really? Go in the dark. Do they have like horns and stuff? Or That's next, right? Uh, what else can you get hybridized? Th think beyond animals, plants. Hybrid automobile. That's, that's why I have that up there. And what, what makes a hybrid automobile? Yes, Dave. There's what? Oh, yes. A lot of hybrid themes in alien movies. Hence, they're aliens. Do what? Absolutely. Hybrid mosquitoes. You know, I, I just, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be the guy who changed the mosquitoes DNA, dumped them out in Florida on purpose, mind you. It all turns into the zombie apocalypse. We've seen all of those movies. And then they all point the finger at me going, uh, you got it wrong there, pal, didn't you? Don't believe you're blaming me. I would hate to be that guy. But you're right. It's a theme everywhere. Everything is going to hybridization, uh, hybrid, um, hybrid automobiles that run on what? They, yeah. Did you know that every one of them runs 100% on gas? Exactly. Because even if they run on electric, it takes a burning of a fuel of some kind to generate the electricity to pour into those cars so the cars can have electricity and go down the road. Then you run out of electricity. You got to stop. Somebody's got to generate more, more electricity. So they have to generate more power with more gas of some kind, burning some kind of fuel to light it up and to send it off down the road again. And there, there has to be an agenda. My guess is money. I, there's, I absolutely believe, no doubt, 100% that, uh, certain congressmen are tied up into these um, hybrid companies that sell batteries, that sell hybrid motors, or that in some way generate electricity. What'd you guys look up there? Anything? Anybody look up anything? What? Okay. So anyway, uh, that's, the, that's the theme of this world right now is that we're able to hybridize things. Now, we know that there are, and I don't think I have this as part of my notes this morning, but I, we, we know that we have computers that, uh, we call them quantum computers. Is that somebody's question, by the way? Quantum computers that operate by way of tapping into, get this, this is their words, an alternative dimension. That's, that's how it was described by the guy who, who built a quantum computer. He said, we are tapping in and using the resources from an alternative universe. Now, there's those computers there. Those big quantum computers have to be kept at just barely above zero degrees Kelvin. Does anybody know what the... Kelvin 
uh, temperature is. If you are zero degrees Kelvin, what does that mean? Do what? We don't, we're America, Jack. We don't say the word Celsius anywhere around here, buddy. It's Fahrenheit. No kidding. No kidding. Raise your hand if while you were in school, your teachers said, now at some point in the future, we'll all be using the metric system. And none of us are. One guy who lives in a world upside down and backwards. Anyway. Um, zero degree, at zero degrees Kelvin. Do what? Okay, but what happens at, at that temperature? Absolutely, call it absolute zero. What happens at that temperature? All of the things spinning around in an atom stop. They don't move. The electrons don't spin around. The, the uh, neutrons and the protons, there is zero movement. Okay, in, in other words... Basically, the end of everything. And they keep it down to almost that temperature so that computer can think. And back when I was in high school hearing about Kelvin, I, did, I didn't think they would ever get down that low, but apparently they can. But anyway, the idea is they're tapping into an alternate dimension. Now, let's take that computer and let's teach it Artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, Brother Reg Kelly, a couple years ago, asked me to come down to his church to his camp meeting. And um, he said, Mike, would you do something for me? I said, anything. He said, would you, would you talk a little bit about artificial intelligence? And I said, sure, I will. I didn't know exactly what I would do, but I said, I'll do it to the best of my ability. And what I did was I went to chat GPT which is an artificial intelligence, I can talk to an, an intelligent computer and I can have a chat with it and it will give me responses that I cannot tell it's a computer talking. So I asked this computer to answer two or three theological questions and I asked them, uh, give me, uh, describe for me how, this is one of them, describe for me how the imagery of the blood in the Old Testament of the King James Bible is used to illustrate the blood of Christ atoning for the sins of mankind. And I had, and it, what it sent me back in a matter of six seconds, I read it to all those preachers there at that camp meeting. Not a one of them could tell that that wasn't written by a human being. In other words, I had them saying amen to everything that computer said. Okay? Now that's scary. What would happen if artificial... And see, here's how artificial intelligence works. It works by collecting every piece of information that it possibly can. The words that I just spoke, along with the body gestures that I just made, those are just recorded and they're being sent up line. Now, you would think that that has no purpose whatsoever. OK, but to an A.I., that's food. They eat that. They they think about that and it helps them to be more human than humans are. I've used this illustration before of um, if you're driving down the interstate, let's say you're going to go down 55 or 67 or 44 out to Oklahoma City or Joplin and you, you pull up on, uh, there's, there's something blocking the road. And so you can pull out Google Maps, right? Pull out Google Maps and you can look at Google Maps and it'll be red on the map. 
And you can see how far along that that red line lasts. Is this going to is this a, a like a just a real small stoppage in traffic or is this going to go on for about five or ten miles? Do I need to look for an alternate route? Now, I pondered that one time. I was asking myself myself and myself said, huh? And I said, how is it that Google figures this out? Because one time I pulled up to uh, uh, an accident that had just happened. And there was but about four cars stopped there in the road. And mine was the last one. And I looked at my Google Maps and was already drawing red. You see, I thought that maybe Google Maps was keeping uh, track of how the police move around and go to various places and they record police events. But that's not what happens. Google met Google keeps track of everybody's phone. Everybody's phone. If you've got a Google app owned by Google on your phone, it keeps track of where your phone is 100% of the time. And what it does is when it sees three or four or five or six cars that have been stopped in the road, it automatically draws a red line in the road right there. And then it starts building the red line for as far back as it goes so you can look in real time and see when that wreck started, how long it's going to take you to get around it, and so on and so on. And I'm going, least of these things are keeping track of us every place we go to. Every place we go, every place we have been, every purchase we have made. I mean, everything that happens in our life is being used and recorded by artificial intelligence. It, like I said, it feeds on data and data is worth more right now than gold bars are. Guarantee you. Okay. And so anyway, that's that's the world that we now currently currently live in. What if we combine these um, these computers um, the way the the way the guy described it in his talk was he said, I could write down on a sheet of paper an, an equation that would take uh, the fastest regular computer that there is, it would take it about 10,000 years to calculate this out. Or I could feed it, and it, it's already been done, I could feed it into an AI or a uh, quantum system and it'll be done in about 30 seconds. That's a, that's a big deal. So an artificial intelligence machine that, has, that collects every tiny, minuscule piece of data and feeds it into a computer that is so fast we can't even we can't even count how fast it is nor determine how fast it is the whole the whole question is just moot there's just no way we can figure it out it is a god in other words it is a god it's a hybrid god but it's a god yes ma'am Sure. And, um, and maybe if, if before we had quantum computers, demon knowledge of the human race was limited, and now that we have quantum computers and we're feeding them everything about us, their knowledge about the human race mm -hmm. infinite. Thank you. I'll let you come take over for me. <laughs> no, no. Can you tell us what you said? Couldn't hear. Yeah. Couldn't hear. Um, what did you say? I forgot. <laughs> that the, the, the dimension, you said that it was a different dimension, so I was thinking... It's That's the dimensions that the spirits live in. Yes. And time in that dimension doesn't mean the same as it does in this one. Right. Okay. And was limited, limited but now we're them unlimited, unlimited knowledge about people 
Yep. They're learning more about, I don't know what that would mean for us. It would just mean that that's the way they're going to take us over from God, right? I, well, okay, let's do this. Um, let's go to Revelation 13. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a very good uh, question. Revelation 13. Let's talk about this beast. Because that's what it will be. Uh, it will be a beast human. No, amen. I got that backwards. It will be a human beast. No, no, I still have it backwards. Thank you. It will be a hybrid. Okay. Uh, in, in Revelation 13. Uh, let's see. Um, look, at, look at verse 4. They worship the, the dragon. Which gave power unto the beast. And worship the beast saying. Who is like unto the beast. And who is able to make war with him. So, if you, um, who in here knows how to play checkers? Who in here knows how to play checkers with an artificial intelligence machine? You don't. You don't because you will never, ever win. You will never win. Uh, who plays chess? I don't. Because it's too hard to find the pieces after I've thrown them. <laughs> okay. Um, but you, you have never and you will never ever play chess with an artificial intelligence machine. Because you will never ever win. Uh, when AI makes the connection with... Uh, the quantum universe, the artificial intelligence machine will not examine one, excuse me, one move after another that you make. It will have already examined every move that you have already possibly made and it already knows how to beat you Almost before you ever get started. If that, if that makes sense to you. And chess and checkers are both war games. That's what they are. They're, they're pieces where you have kings and, and you have knight, you have knights and so on and, and pawns and bishops and so on and they move across the board in a, in a certain way. Uh, but basically it's a war game. And, and when you look at Revelation 13, who is like unto beast, unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? So that, that question has already been answered. The fact that we cannot ever, ever beat the quantum computers, the AI machines at any kind of war game whatsoever, that already right now is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. God was right, wasn't he? Amen. God was right. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know. It's been about 10 years ago, and I think you're talking about the same thing. 10, 10 50 years ago, we started hearing about a, a computer in England or something that was called the Beast. I've heard that rumor back in the 80s, back before the Internet, and uh, it's irrelevant now because any computer built back in the 80s at best, at best, could have ran Windows 3. OK, 3.1, somewhere around in there. OK, so at best. Uh, it can play. Uh, what is that card game? Ever? Solitaire. OK. That's that's the comparison. The fact the fact that it's referred to as a beast means that it lacks humanity. So take your Bible, turn to Genesis six. Genesis six.
Verse 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, uh, and that they took them wives of all which they chose. Um, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants. Remember, we saw that verse last night. And we found out that our King James Bible was wrong, didn't we? We found out that it said there were the Nephilim on the earth at that time. King James ain't wrong. Okay. I'm headed in that direction today. It may take me all day to get there, but that's the direction we're headed in. Okay. Um, anyway, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So now you have, you can see it up on the screen, giants equals hybrids. That's what giants are. They are a hybrid species. Because their species lacks something. It lacks humanness, humanity. It doesn't have the ability to feel the way we feel, uh, to love the way we love, to think the way we think, and so on. And so I want you to think about this for a minute. Uh, let's say that um, uh, let's say that you were gonna you were gonna build a god. You're gonna carve out with a hammer and chisel and everything. You're gonna carve out your own god, and you really can't carve out a god that you have not seen before can you because if you haven't seen it then how can you know how to carve it so generally when you that's why when you look at all of the old ancient gods that were carved into rocks or carved out of rocks they always look like something that we recognize they may look like uh, a, a, a fish or they may uh, they may uh, look like uh, a, 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 a stalk of corn or they may look like a, a, a human in some aspect but there's always something about it that we recognize because our imagination can't really go beyond anything that we haven't seen so here's my point if mankind were to make a brand new God, a God that has never, ever existed on this earth at any time in history, he will always carve out a God of some kind that he recognizes from his past or from time past. Does that make sense to you? He's going to carve out a God that looks like something that he's seen before. Primarily, that's going to be something that is human-like. So now, we're making a God in the laboratories of the, of the biggest, um, the top money-making computer companies in the world. We're building robots. Robots that can uh, do things that humans can do or do things that humans can't do or do things that humans can do, only humans are too slow at it. 
And that it costs too much to have humans do it. So we don't use humans. We use robots. And we plug them in at night. And we go to Sam's the next day. And those old Sam's robots are going up and down. Now, have you seen those at Sam's? They go up, they go up down the aisle and they sweep the floor for you. Huh? And they stop when they're... And, and they don't look annoyed. You know, like, would you hurry up? Come on. Okay. They don't look annoyed. They just keep on sweeping. And when you're in the way, they just stop, you know, whatever. But we make gods according to the image that we are familiar with. Hence the word familiar spirit. Okay. Dagon. When the Israelites, they wanted the, uh, the, the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. Israelites wanted it back. They found out that it was in the temple of Dagon. And Dagon, according to what we know, looked like half human, half fish of some type. And that's the kind of God that he was. And they found the next morning that Dagon had fallen down before the Ark of the Covenant. That ought to tell you, that's a prophecy right there. That is a prophecy. Let me throw this at you, since I'm just chasing rabbits all over the place anyway. What would a half-human, half-fish God look like? Yeah, very weird. I don't have a picture of it, but... The headdress that it would have on its head would look like the mouth and the head of a fish, a carp. I know it was that 97 pound carp that Brother George caught. <laughs> That's what it was. He caught Dagon. Amen. Uh, y'all, y'all just you'll love Brother George. You get a chance to meet him tomorrow. You'll love him to death. But anyway, um. They built that God to look like it had a fish head with its mouth open. And that looks exactly like the miter that the bishops wear in the Catholic Church. So imagine, and I'm not sure this is how it's going to work, but imagine that a um, some sort of uh, uh, archaeological dig is taking place. And all of a sudden, they dig into a place and they find a box that looks like the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And they pull out the Ark of the Covenant. Who is it that wants the Ark of the Covenant? Well, that's one of the biggest prizes in the world ever. Okay? But more than likely, the people who will end up with it are the people whose priests wear the Dagon fish hats. Just think about that. I'm just, I don't know, but think about it, all right? Um, so in Genesis 6, we, ha we have these hybrid gods. They are half human. They are half God. They have, um, they have some of the aspects of their fathers, their spiritual fathers, and they have some of the aspects of their, of their earthly mothers. Okay? Now that's got to be weird, but that's how they looked, that's how they were, and we don't think, when we think of something that's half of something, we don't think it's split down the middle, how on the right side it looks like a, uh, uh, an ancient god of some kind. On the left side it looks like just some human being. We, we know that they're going to be mingled together in some fashion, just like a person would be who is, who is of, of two races. You can see both races in that person. All right. So anyway, these giants were hybrids. Um, Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Boy. A lot of deep stuff going on here. Let's 
stuff that I tried to I tried to just put together things that I don't think I've talked about. Um, and primarily the reason why I didn't talk about them is I'd probably get in trouble if I did. I'd, so this may be the last time I ever see you. No. <laughs> uh, Second Corinthians chapter six. Watch this now. What symbol is that up on the screen? The yin yang symbol. Okay, because um, it represents this idea in, it's in Buddhism, it's in Taoism, uh, it's in um, uh, different Asian religions, and the concept is that there is a little white in all black and a little black in all white and whatever that means. It could mean that there's a little light in all darkness and there's a little darkness in all light. And we've been studying this on, uh, I think, uh, what, Sunday night uh, about uh, Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter 1 chapter 2 and so on uh, where when God created light he separated the light from the darkness there is a division there and there's no gray area with God amen but man's evil as man is building this artificial intelligence machine Man thinks that there is a little evil in all good and a little good in all evil. That's how man thinks. And that's how man is going to build this artificial intelligence machine. This machine that is going to be able to think that there is some evil in good and that there is some good in evil. And so if we build something that's evil... We're not building it completely evil. There's going to be a little good in it. That's why in some movies, since we brought up movies a while ago, in some movies, the bad guy, the really, really stinky, nasty bad guy, at the end becomes the savior. He does something good at the end that saves everybody. And uh, he is what this symbol represents. He, that little bit of good in him, like Darth Vader. Like Darth Vader, okay? Yes? Isn't that kind of like the knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Yep. In a sense. Yep. Tree of knowledge of what and what? Good and evil. Yep, good and evil. Very good, Will. Very good. Um... That's why the Jews worship that tree in the Kabbalah, the Jewish religion. They worship at the, at the feet of what they call the tree of life. But it's not really the tree of life. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it has two pillars by it. One is a pillar that has a positive symbol... One is a pillar that has a negative symbol. One pillar, which is the negative one that's supposed to represent evil, is not totally black, it's gray. And the other one is not totally white, it's got a little bit of gray in it too. Because it symbolizes that there's a little good in all evil, a little evil in all good. And, and that's what the yin-yang symbol represents. But here's how God sees it. God sees it in 2 Corinthians 6, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Somebody tell me how that works. How, how is it you can be unequally yoked with an unbeliever? Marriage. Yep. Yes. Oh my goodness, I just got there. Stop. 
Don't think of will in a dress. No. You make a vow. If I'm joining the fraternity, I'm also saying vows. Yeah. Yeah. You're making vows. You are speaking. A, you're making an oath, a promise to that. That's very good. Give me another illustration. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you join a church and in joining the ch- now you can go to a church. OK. Nobody can stop you from going to a church. If you join, however, a church and join with that church body, that means that you are finding yourself in agreement with all of their doctrines, their purposes, everything that that church is. Now, um, I've had people call our office and talk to me and ask me a question like this. Um, You know, pastor, they're wanting me to give an oath and sign an oath document that I agree with everything that they teach and preach. And then I'll say, okay, so what's the problem? And then they'll read me the oath and I'll say, well, if, if that's something that you cannot bide with, you cannot deal with, then I would not sign that oath and I would not join that church. Okay. Now you can still go there. Okay. But you'll never be Sunday school superintendent. You'll never be the bus captain. You'll never be this. You'll never be that. Uh, You'll never hold any position in the church because you're not a member and because you won't sign that that particular oath. Okay. And so, yeah, that happens that way. Somebody else. Yes. Business Business partnering. Yes. Be careful who you get in business with. You get in business with people that are not saved and suppose that they want to do something that is a little shady. Okay, it's something that they um, they really, if they're going to be Christians, they probably shouldn't ever be like this. And you joined with them. They're going to go ahead and do it. You had a vote. You got voted out. In other words, you, your your vote was overridden by theirs. And so they're going to go ahead and do it. Um, you've just you've just done harm to yourself because even if you voted no on it, you're still along with that company or that corporation or whatever, and you could be held you could be held count, uh, liable legally. You could be held liable for whatever it was you did. And so that's another way. Yes, Chris. Yeah. You belong to some sort of organization like a trade union. Okay. Um, Now, I told uh, my son, Matthew, back when he um, first got in, he was going to be a carpenter. And um, he he was in order to work for this company, he had to join the carpenters union. And uh, I told him what to watch out for. I said, they're going to be pretty rough on you. And um, so he came home first day and he said, yeah, they they were pretty rough. And uh, he came home all excited one day. He said, Dad, you should have seen it. He said, man, somebody brought food. There was food all over the place and they brought sodas and other sodas. And they (laughs) I mean, they brought all kinds of good food and they fed us well, you know, gave us an extra hour for lunch and all this and that and the other. And I said, yep. It's an election year. Who'd they tell you to vote for? (laughs) And I said, son, everybody's got to work. Okay, I believe that. Everybody's got to work. If they put you in a trade union, they're going to pay you. And that's the agreement that you made. Then sign up with them. But do not let them tell you how to vote. It's that simple. Don't let them tell you how to do it. Okay. Somebody else very quickly. Then, Yes, Dave. Huh? 
The friends you run with, absolutely. Do you, be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, and, and that is also, and I'll tell you a story. Back years ago when I was pastoring out in Washington County here in Richwoods, um, there was a couple down there that they both gave their life uh, back to the Lord and um, they got married and uh, were, were, you know, trying to live for the Lord and so on. Well, he had a, an issue with alcohol and he wanted to start, he wanted to go back drinking again. And he wanted people to tell him that it was okay to drink. So he'd have a conversation with his mom, had a conversation with his dad, had a conversation with his brother, had a conversation with his friends. The only person he didn't ask me, ask was me. Okay. And um, he made the mistake of bringing it up in Sunday school class one time. And he said, oh, I kind of believe you can do uh, anything you want to as long as it's in moderation. You know, the Bible says that. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And uh, so anyway, I answered him back. And I said, uh, I don't think I was as bold back then as I am now. Because back then I thought I really did care about how people thought of me. Now I just don't care. But anyway, uh, it, it really, it, I, was, I was prepared for it because his mom told me that's what was going down. And uh, I just flat out told him, I said, the Bible says nothing about how okay it is for you to drink alcohol and what he was doing was he was going to all the right people and he was picking out the people that he knew would agree with him and those were going to be the people that he was going to associate with that he was going to run with that he was going to be friends with that the people that didn't see anything wrong with having a drink at the end of the day or a drink on the way home or drink this or drink that that didn't have a problem with it and uh, sure enough, not too long later, he's just he's just drinking every day now. And I and I saw that come and I really did be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness. The answer to that question is none. There is no um, fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness or what communion hath light with darkness. None. There is no communion that uh, light hath with darkness. Can you can you imagine in Genesis chapter one and God saw the light that it was half OK and half not OK? No, it doesn't say that at all. God said that the light was good, but the darkness ain't. And all those of you who have been in darkness know that it's not fun there. Amen. You'd rather be in the light. Um and then, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Uh, we just touched on that. So I'm going to move on. 1 John 1, 5. This, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is what? God is light. So can God have a little bit of bad in him? No, but the message that's being sold through Hollywood and other forms of media to mankind is that God has a few flaws here, here and there. And all you got to do to sell that um, is to get um, Morgan, what's his name? Morgan Freeman to play God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You get Morgan Freeman to play God, you'll believe anything in the world he says. Okay? Uh, I'm referring to the movie uh, Bruce Almighty. Okay? And in, and in the movie Bruce Almighty, Morgan Freeman says to uh, Jim Carrey, there's a spark of divinity in every human being. Okay? That is Jewish Kabbalah. That is um, Hindu religion. That is Buddhism. That is uh, all of practically all of the Asian religions teach now that there is just a little bit of divinity in all of us humans and that we need to do do things 
things like yoga, things like um, ritualism, that we have to do things in order to get that spark of divinity to come out full blown into a, a full blown fire of Godhood where you yourself are now equal with God. And folks, something I, I may make a lot of mistakes in life and I do. Something you'll never ever hear me say. I am not equal with God. Um, I'll never say that I am because I know that I'm not.